Welcome everyone to another seminar at Physics Latin. Today we are very happy to have Raimundo Helwani talking about vertex algebra and algebraic curves. Helwani is a mathematician specialized in vertex algebra, chiral algebra, infinite dimensional algebra, superconformal field theory, and representation theory. He earned his PhD from MIT on the supervision of Victor Katt. Uh, he has made significant contributions to the mathematical foundations of conformal field theory, particularly study uh, focusing in superconformal algebras and their applications to physics. His process, uh, he is a professor at the Institute of Mathematics Applied, Pure and Applied, IMPA in Brazil, and he has published influential research connecting algebraic structures with quantum field theory. Uh, please remember to raise your hand during the talk if you have any question, and I will leave you with Raimundo. Please go ahead. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, I let's let's set a little bit the tone of this talk before of this of this class. I've my understanding is that you guys have been having a course that has mostly been based on linear algebra and representation theory, infinite dimensional algebra and the such. And I've gotten the notes that Jethro's, of Jethro's Vanegren's talk on what he's talked about on vertex algebra. I prepared some slides, well, they're just handwritten slides, which we can just drop and change the class on the fly. That's why I connected here with the tablet in case you guys want something else. But what I prepared to talk about is going to be very, very different in, in flavor. Uh, I want to give you what is the geometric side to vertex algebra, and it's not going to look at all as what you have been seeing on vertex algebra. Uh, only in the la very last slide that I prepared, there's the connection to vertex algebra. So I'm going to start with something that is quite technical and quite complicated, but I'm going to take a hand wavy approach. So um, I want to give you first the intuition behind it, avoiding any technical details, and then slowly, slowly getting more into depth into what are the technical aspects that we need. So exactly in the opposite tone of what Daniel just said, uh, if you guys want to interrupt me, feel free to please, and actually just unmute yourself and ask a question. That's going to make it much better for me also, because I think we might have less than two hours, hopefully. Anyways, I'm going to try to pace it as slow as possible. Uh, the talk is, self is mostly self-contained, although I will mention some technical tools like D modules and such that uh, we might just take it as a black box. All right, so let's get to the point. There are three objects, three classes of objects that are the same. You have already seen vertex algebra which is a, manifesta a linear algebra manifestation of what conformal field theory is, of what the OPE of conformal field theory is. There's a purely geometric manifestation of it, which is factorization algebra. And there are different flavors for this one as well. You may have heard of uh, factorization algebra a la Costello and Williams, for example. This is in the smooth setting, in the real smooth setting, which is closer to what physicists talk about when they talk about locality of fields and how uh, fields factorize. What I'm going to be talking about is more on the algebra geometric setting, which is actually on the mathematical literature slightly older, which is due to Bellison and Dreyfeld. And the way to connect these two, this is why this arrow is dotted, why these two arrows are solid, is via something intermediate, which is called chiral algebras. Chiral algebras are an algebra geometric uh, representation of what Lie algebras are in a very special category. And it's, I will take today the approach that chiral algebras are something intermediate. Out of a vertex algebra, you can immediately construct a chiral algebra. Out of a chiral algebra, you can immediate, well, out of special chiral algebras, you can get vertex algebras. And between chiral algebras and factorization algebras, there's a very simple relation. So this is the relation that I want to talk about today. Uh, by connecting these two arrows, you get this equivalence between vertex algebras or certain kinds of vertex algebras and factorization algebras. Uh, what I'll mostly be talking about is give an intuition as to what these geometric objects are. 
what is factorization algebras. And then in the very last slide, just connect with both lateral algebras and vertex algebras. Okay, so let's get to that. Factorization algebras are going to be for us first a game. And the game goes as follows. Let's start with a topological space. Any space would do. And let's try to construct the following. You, you give me a point in this space, and I'll give you a vector space associated to that point. So for the point x, I'll give you the vector space vx. You give me two points on the vector space, and I'll give you a vector space. So for the pair of points x and y, I'll give you the vector space v of x, y, and so forth. For three points, I'll give you a vector space associated to these three points. And for any n number of points, you need to construct a vector space associated to these n points. Now, these vector spaces cannot be just random. They need to satisfy some conditions. And here are some of the conditions that we want them to, have to satisfy. If you give me two different points, so we have three different vector spaces that we associated to this. Actually, we have four different vector spaces that we associated to this. We have the vector space V associated to the pair X, Y. We also have the, pair, the, the vector space associated to X alone. We have the vector space associated to Y alone. And here I didn't write, but I should have written also the vector space V of Y, X. And we will require this first isomorphism between these vector spaces. So if the two points are different, then we would get this isomorphism between the vector space that we associated to the pair x, y, and the tensor product of the two spaces that we associated to x and to y. From here, from this isomorphism, because the tensor product of vx with vy is, this, is isomorphic to the tensor product of vy with vx, we would get an isomorphism between the vector space v, x, y, and the vector space v, y, x. So perhaps this is why I missed to write that extra vector space, because it's going to be isomorphic to this. And the second condition is that if you repeat the same point, so if you give me vxx, then this should be isomorphic to vx. Now, you can guess what are going to be the conditions for the higher number of points. So if you give me n points, and some of them, and all of them are different, then you would also want to have this isomorphism between v of the tuple of points, x1 up to xn, and the tensor product of all the points, of all the vector spaces, vx1, tensor vx2, tensor vxn, up to vxn. And if some of these spaces repeat, some of these points are repeated, like in this case, well, then you will just can drop some of these repetitions. And the point is that this vector space should only depend on the underlying set of points without counting repetitions and without caring about the order. So that's part of the data. And of course, we would make this a geometric object by requiring that these vector spaces are not just randomly jumping around when you move the points on the, on the variety X, on, the, on this topological space X, but we want them to vary smoothly. So I said topological space, but now I'm using the word smoothly. So probably better to have this X to be a variety. And then this VXN would need to be something that moves smoothly as I move the point on the, the tuple of points on X to the end. So let's try to work, walk towards giving a proper definition of this object. So here, what I was saying on how these conditions would continue growing, and we're going to get an infinite family of conditions on these vector spaces. So if you repeat this point x, x, y, well, this should be, because x and y are different, the same as v, x, x, tensor v, y, which is the same as v, x, y, because I'm repeating this xx, which is the same as byx, which is the same as this space, where I repeat now y instead of x, and this is the same as this, and so forth. So we get infinitely many conditions, and I hope that you, you guys can imagine what how this family of condition continues. Now, this condition, that statement that these spaces should vary smoothly over xn, well, we better adjust these guys to be a vector bundle over x to the n. So that's one way of saying a vector space that moves smoothly when the base point moves. And then we, if we have such a vector bundle, we can consider the fiber of that vector bundle over a tuple x1 up to xn. Well, and that's going to be the vector space that you give me associated to those, uh, to those points. 
Now notice that whenever you have a power x to the n of your topological space or your variety or whatever it is, and then higher power for that guy x to the n, then you can just consider many different diagonal embeddings in which you can make some of the points be equal on x to the n. So you always have close embeddings uh, of your power n to a power m. And well, we have different vector bundles. The vector bundle over xm, whose fiber was this vector space associated to m points. And we have another vector bundle vn over xn, whose fiber was the vector space associated to n points. And what we are requiring is that when you pull back the bundle over xm to xn, you get back the bundle vn. So this is the condition that when vxx, when the point is equal, you get the same thing as v sub x. So that condition gets identified with this property. And now we have a proper definition. We're looking at a family of vector bundles on each power of x with this property that if you pull back your vector bundles along diagonals, you get isomorphisms. But that's not good enough. This gives you the condition of re repeating points, but it doesn't give you this condition of having a tensor product. It doesn't give you for free this thing that Vxy was the tensor product of Vx with Vy. So how do we express that condition? Well, that one is slightly harder to describe. So let's, uh, let's analyze just the case n is equal to 1 and m is equal to 2. So that's going to be good enough to do all of the other ones. So in this situation, we have one copy of x here where we're putting the vector bundle v1. And over a point x on x, the fiber of this vector bundle v1 is this vector space v sub x. So we take another copy of the same vector bundle over x. We pull them both back by the two different projections to x squared. And we take the tensor product there. So here, this tensor product is the tensor product of v1 with itself, with v1, but pulled back over different projections from x squared to x. This is just a matter of notation. This box product means just that. v1 box v1 means pull back v1 by one projection, pull back v1 by one projection on the other side, and take the tensor product of those two. Now, this bundle is a bundle that lives over x squared. And over x squared, we already had a different bundle v2. The fibers of v2 over the pair of points xy is the vector space vxy that we were looking for. And these two bundles might be different. But the statement is that if you restrict both bundles away from the diagonal, namely when the two points x and y are actually different, then they should be equal or they should be isomorphic. Because the fiber on the right-hand side here on v2 over the point x, y is v, x, y. And the fiber over this guy on the left-hand side here is the tensor product of v, x with v, y. And we wanted this to be the an isomorphism. So this is the second type of conditions that we had. We had some vector bundles over x, m, for some pa high power of m. We write x, m as a product of copies of x with less number of, uh, with less number of copies. In this case, it's x2 that we wrote as x times x. And we have two different sets of bundles, but which are not isomorphic, but they are when we restrict them to the open, to an open subset. So we immediately see something funny here going on. Let's analyze the dimension of these fibers. Okay, so this V2 has two properties has the property that away from the diagonal, it looks like V1 tensor V1. And it has the property that in the diagonal, it looks at just a copy of V1. If I pull V2 back along the diagonal, I should get just V1. That was the condition. I'm going to move to the previous slide a little bit here. If I pull back V2 along the diagonal, I should get V1. So this is funny because if you look at the fiber of this thing, at the rank of these bundles, we're saying that the rank of this bundle, let's suppose that the rank of V1 is 3. It's a vector bundle of rank, of rank 3. This means that the fiber over any point of V1 is 3. And this means that the fiber of this tensor product is 9. 
So V2 has this funny property that away from the diagonal has rank nine and in the diagonal has rank three. But that's impossible. You cannot have a vector bundle or you cannot have a quasi-coherent sheaf over, over a variety, over a manifold, whose dimension, whose rank jumps down on special fibers. This is the diagonal which is closed. So typically what you can have is that the dimension or the rank will jump up. So this means that we cannot have these conditions unless the dimension of these spaces, well, all these spaces are zero, that's fine, that works. The spaces are non-zero, but then the dimension is either one, because one times one is also one, so it's fine, it works, or infinity. There cannot be a finite rank for these vector bundles. And this is the reason, this is mainly the reason why vertex algebras do not really come in finite dimensions, except the vacuum vertex algebra, or except very degenerate cases. But here's a geometric explanation for it, is because vertex algebras would give rise to these objects that factorize, that have this property, this family of vector bundles, and you cannot have this family of vector bundles jumping down in dimension on the diagonal. All right. There's another thing which makes it why in conformality theory we work with dimension two and not higher dimensions. And it's very hard to come up actually with a definition of vertex algebra or factorization algebra that works in higher dimensions than dimension two over the complex numbers. Let's suppose that the variety X was a complex variety and that we wanted to do everything holomorphically. So these vector spaces are vector spaces over the complex numbers and these spaces move smoothly over the variety X or their powers. So that means that there are holomorphic vector bundles over these varieties. Then we have a problem because by Hartog's theorem, the fact that we have this V2 that was equal to V1 times or V1 away from the diagonal, that would already identify V2 as V1 times or V1 everywhere. Because if the, dim if the dimension of X is bigger than one, then the co-dimension of the diagonal is also bigger than one. And a section that agrees away from something of co-dimension bigger than one would agree everywhere by Hartos theorem. So this means that we can never find a non-trivial example of what we're looking for if the dimension of X as a variety is bigger than one. That restricts ourselves to working with X being an algebraic curve. So from now on, X would be a smooth algebraic curve over the complex numbers. And everything I'm, I'm going to say may have a, var a variant over singular curves. Some of this thing has been already worked out. I should probably mention the names of uh, Gibney, Tarasca, and Damiolini. I think used to, well, anyways. <laughs> uh, those three people have written a series of papers in the last few years where they are picking up the study of these uh, structures when the curve is actually singular instead of uh, smooth. So there's nothing inherently fundamental in requiring this X to be smooth, but we're going to restrict to smooth spaces. So, okay, so now we have a tentative definition of what we want to. We want this family of smooth, smoothly varying vector spaces that we can construct, and we want them to have these two type of factorizations. That when we restrict along the diagonals, we get the lower dimensional vector bundles. And when we restrict away from diagonals, we get tensor products. So we want to have geometric construction. We want to have algebraic construction of these objects. And I want to tell you that such an object would be the same as a vertex algebra. So, so the plan is to tell you, to describe why these spaces are essentially determined by what you do over one copy of X over the curve, and you don't need all the higher powers of X. But I also want to describe the whole collection of vector bundles. So the vector bundle that gave me VX, the vector bundle that gave me VXY and so forth as a single vector bundle on an infinite dimensional space, sort of like a limit of all the, power, all the higher powers of X. And I want to describe this factorizing condition as a commutative algebra structure on that vector bundle. So this is uh, the, the, the insight as to what these objects are. So we don't really need all the higher powers that are completely determined to what happens at the lower powers. Uh, and uh, the factorization condition that I spelled out in the, in the square case, which is 
V2 restricted away from the diagonal is a tensor product of V1. This is equivalent to having a community value structure somewhere. All right. So let's start with the baby version of this. And this is something that we've learned in our first algebra class. When you have a map of sets, just a map of sets, and you have a function on the target, you can always compose it with your function, and you get a function on the source. So this is the basic, the very basic in algebra geometry is that you define maps between varieties to be a pair, a map on the topological spaces and a map, a way of pulling back functions. So a map of the rings of functions, a ring homomorphism. But if your map is, has finite fibers or compact fibers in the topological case or proper fibers in algebra geometry, you can actually do more. You can integrate along the fibers. In this case, I took the point of like saying I have finite fibers. And then if I have a function on X, I obtain a function on Y by summing over all of the elements in the fiber. If I had topological spaces and I had measures around, I could require that the fibers are compact and I would replace this sum by an integral. But the point is that you need, you can always compose functions, so you can always pull back functions. But in order to push forward, to push them forward, you need some finiteness condition or some compactness condition. So we can use both of these things. Suppose that you have some space that has an associative operation. At this point, I won't even need the associativity. Uh, I just need a map from the space times itself to the space. And what we can do is the following. If you have a function uh, f on g, another function g on g, so these are functions from this space G to say the complex numbers or the real numbers or whatever it is. You can pull back these two functions along the two different projections. This is something that we've already done before. We, we did it for vector bundles. Now we're doing it for functions. So we pull back these two functions to G times G. And now we multiply these two functions on G times G. So we get the product. And let's suppose that this operation that we had has finite fibers so that we can push it forward. So we've obtained another function on G. And this operation is called convolution. And it only required the fact that we had this map phi from G times G to G. Now, if phi is associative, if this operation is associative, then this multiplication, the star multiplication that we just defined this way, happens to be associative. And this is, for example, if G is a group, this is what is called the group algebra of G. If phi is commutative, this operation is also commutative. And the convolution algebra is also commutative. And you will need some unital structure on G if you want this, conv this convolution to be unital as well. But all I wanted to, put, to, to point here is that convolution is, this is whenever you have a, a multiplication, which is associative, you get an associative product on, your, on functions on your space by this convolution property. You pull back under two projections and then push forward by the operation. And something funny is that you don't even need the operation phi to be defined everywhere. Sometimes just operation phi is defined on an open subset of G times G, and you still get a product star, which is associative. All right, so if we have a space with an operation, which is associative, we get this associative product on functions. But what is the shift version of this? What is the vector bundle version of this? If you know what a shift is, great. If you don't and know what a vector bundle is, just think of vector bundles. If you have a vector bundle or a shift on G and another vector bundle on G, you can pull those two back, guys back, take the tensor product on G times G. This is the symbol box times that I said before. And you can push it forward to G again by this operation phi. Now, this operation, which is a sort of like a bilinear operation on sheaves on the space G, I am calling it the tensor product with an upper phi because it depends on the operation phi. And if phi is associative, this operation is associative. And if phi is commutative, this operation is symmetric. You get an actual tensor product on the category of sheaves on G. 
So this is a way of constructing tensor products on the category of shifts on G, which is called the, temp the convolution tensor product. And this happens whenever you have an operation that is associative. And again, you can do this even if phi is not well-defined everywhere, but defined on an open subset. For those of you who knows algebra geometry, we are interested in rational maps, maps that are defined, for example, by rational maps and, and the form. Okay, so let's describe what is this push forward for a map that has finite fibers. So if you look at the fiber of a push forward of the shift at, at a point Y, you just get the sum in exactly the same way as we did before to push up to push functions we get a sum and this is why we want finite sums here finite fibers here so that if f had for example finite uh, rank was a vector bundle finite rank this sum here is also finite dimensional so in the case that we have a multiplication what is the fiber of this tensor product that we defined so you have a point x on x and we have this funny tensor product that we define that depends on the operation phi. The fiber of that thing over a point x is, well, you look at the, all the ways of multiplying x prime times x second prime to be x, and you get the fiber of one vector bundle tensor the fiber of the other vector. And you sum over all ways. So that's the fiber of the funny looking tensor product. All right. There's no questions to this point. I can continue with. <clears throat> okay. So here's the gist of uh, the main object that we want to study. This is called the rank space, and it's defined for any topological space. The idea is that I want to study configurations of points on the topological space X. So when people do algebraic geometry, they tend to confuse this space with another space that is also studying the configuration of points on a space, which is the Hilbert scheme of a scheme. This is different. When you have an algebraic variety, you can look at, say, two points on this algebraic variety. And you can try to understand what is the moduli space of two points in a variety. And then as the two points are different, this is fine because it's just x times x. But as the two points collide, you might want to re record how these points are colliding. You're recording which direction these points are colliding. This is a way of resolving the singularity of how the points collide. And this is something that algebraic geometers typically do. They record. The, the points and how they collided. So when you have the same point twice, you have this extra information of what was the direction in which they were colliding. And this assembles itself into a variety or into a scheme. The run space of X is much more brutal and is much simpler to define, at least as a topological space. It's honestly just the collection of subsets of X. So that's the definition of set as a set is the collection of subsets that are finite subsets and they are non-empty subsets of X. So a point in this run space of X is just an arbitrary collection of points in X. So that's as a set. What is the topological space? Well, you notice that for any power N, there is a map from X to the N into the run space of X. Because, well, if you give me N points in X, you consider those collection, those endpoints, as a set. I mean, in this set, I might have some repetitions. That's fine. That's just a set, a subset of X. And this gives you a map. X to the N has a natural product, a natural topological structure. It's just the product structure. So you declare run of X to have the finest topology such that all these maps are continuous. So you start adding open sets to run of X in such a way that the pre-image of those guys are open in X to the N. And you declare, okay, those are all the opens in run of X. So now we have a topological space. And this topological space has a natural product. If you give me two sets, X and T, 
So this, this is a subset of X. This is another subset of X. Their union is a subset of X. So this naturally gives you to an operation on random X, which is on the nodes, associative and commuted. Notice that it's not unital. There's no unit to this product because we're not including the empty subset. The unit would be if we allowed S to be empty, then T union the empty set would be just T. We're not allowing the empty subset because if we allow the empty subset on this topological space run of X, it would be disconnected. That empty subset would be closed and open and it would be completely, it would be a connected component of this run of X. So if we wanted to add a unit to this topological product, which is called a commutative associative product, we would just add an extra point to run of X that represents that unit, which is the usual way that you add a unit whenever you have a commutative associative product that doesn't happen to be unit. You just add an extra object, which is the unit. Okay, so this is the topological space and we have uh, this, this structure. And what I want to describe in the next few slides is how a factorization algebra, which is what we wanted to come up with a proper definition, which was this collection, infinite collection of vector bundles on the infinite powers of XVN, happens to be just a vector bundle over this space run of X. Before doing, though, before doing that, let's analyze which structure this run of X may have. So let's, th there's something that is, that is interesting about this space. This space in itself will not have a non-trivial sheet. And the problem is that run of X is essentially a contractible space. It has vanishing, so every homotopy group of run of X vanishes. Uh, you can more or less see this if you consider, for example, the case where X is just a circle. And you look at two points in a circle and what variety you get. Well, the circle doesn't has a, 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 a non-trivial pi one group. But if you look at two points in the circle, you will get already a non-trivial pi one, uh, a trivial pi one. But it will have a non-trivial pi two. If you look at three points in the circle, so that would be part of this run of X, you will find that the configuration space of three points in a circle is the sphere S3. So this is a null result by Raoul Vought. So you're already seeing vanishing of higher and higher uh, homotopy groups. So this means that you have no hope of having non-trivial vector bundles on this space run of X. So the affirmation that I said before, that factorization algebras correspond to vector bundles on this space run of X, well, that would just already indicate that there are no known trivial factorization algebras. Moreover, let's suppose that X is now a holomorphic variety. We, we wanted this X to be a holomorphic curve. We are interested in doing this. X in, in, the, in our upshot is to relate these factorization algebras with vertex algebras, which are themselves conformal field theories. So the upshot is that this X should be this two-dimensional space underlying a conformal field theory where our conformal field theory lives. So if we take this X to be a holomorphic uh, curve, what is the structure of this run of X? Is it an algebraic variety of infinite dimension? Is it algebraic in any way? And the answer is no. There's no way in which we can make this run of X as opposed to the Hilbert scheme of X which considers all powers of the curve X modulo the symmetric group action, this run of X has no algebraic structure in any form. The reason is that the, po the three points X, so if you take a map from X3 to run of X that takes the triple X, X, Y, gets identified in run of X with the triple X, Y, Y. And this is something very different than in the Hilbert scheme approach. There's no, if you, if this run of X were to be an algebraic variety in any form, if you look at a function near that point that corresponds to X, X, Y, you would find power series on three variables that are equal when you plug in X, X, Y as their argument or X, Y, Y as their argument. And it's an easy exercise to check that there's no no constant power series with that property. So run of X, if it were to be a, an algebraic variety in any form, would not have functions, no no constant functions. 
even locally. So run of X is a very nasty space. And it's infinite dimensional, of course. But still, we want to understand what would be shifts on run of X. And moreover, we want to consider shifts of O modules on run of X and algebraic O modules on run of X. So we're going to gather some intuition as to what is this topological space run of X. And then I'm going to just transform the definition in such a way that it actually produces non-trivial shifts and non-trivial vector bundles. OK. So we had a product. And remember, whenever we have a space with a product, oh, by the way, let me go back one second. Notice that this product has finite fibers. If you have a set, a subset of X is a finite set. That's a point in run of X. The pre-image here is all the ways of expressing your set as a union of two sets. And if you're, this union needs to be by two sets that are non-empty. So there's only finite ways of expressing your set as a union of two sets. So this map satisfies all the properties that we had to construct a tensor product on the category of sheets. This map is commutative and is associative. We won't have a unit because we don't have a unit in run of X, but we will have a tensor product. So we apply that tensor product in the same way that we did before. And I already described in general for arbitrary topological spaces what the fibers would be. Remember what the fiber of this tensor product is. The tensor product is, uh, well, the fiber at a set U is write all the ways that you can write your set U as a union of two sets, S and T. And you just take the fiber of F at S, the fiber of G at T, and take the tensor product. And now the sum over all of these things. This is a finite sum, these are finite fibers here. So you get a well-defined uh, finite vector, a well-defined vector space. Now I told you before that uh, to define this tensor product, uh, here I define one tensor product that I call the star tensor product in the category of sheaves. But to define a product, we did not need the, the map phi to be well-defined everywhere. So we could have a map that is not defined everywhere on run of X, a product, and still construct a tensor product on the category of sheaves. So this new map is exactly the same as phi. So let's go back again a little bit. So it's exactly the same as this map that takes two sets and writes the union, except that I will define this map only, so I'll restrict this map only to disjoint unions. So I would consider this map only defined when S and T are disjoint. And then do the same thing. So what is the new tensor product defined? Well, we pull back a sheet from the first projection. We pull back a sheet from the second projection. We restrict on run of X tensor run of X to the open subset where these two sets S and T are disjoint. And then we push forward. The fiber of that push forward is very similar to what we had before for the star product, it's just that now we restrict to S and T being disjoint. Okay. And these are two different tensor products on the category of shapes. One is called the star product and the other one is called the chiral product. And I will be mostly interested in this chiral tensor product. Okay, so here's the first attempt to give in a proper definition of what a factorization algebra is. A factorization algebra it is a shift on the space run of X for a smooth algebraic curve X together with a commutative product. Well, now we have a tensor category, so I, it's very clearly defined what a commutative algebra structure is on that tensor product. It's the usual definition. It's a map from V tensor V to V that satisfies that if you switch these two factors and you apply the map, you get the same thing as just applying the map without switching the factor. So that's a commutative path. And associativity is another diagram that commutes that you can guess what it is. Now, as I told you before, there aren't any non-trivial sheaves on run of X. So there won't be any non-trivial commutative algebras on run of X. Uh, so we need to tweak this definition slightly. And in particular, I don't want to consider just sheaves of vector spaces. I really want to do geometry. So I want to have something like a notion of a vector bundle on run of X or a sheaf of O modules on random X. Okay, so let's continue slightly with this intuition that we were gonna gather from considering sheaves 
of vector spaces on run of x. So remember, we have maps from x to the n to run of x. I will call them the inclusion i n. These maps, just again, if you give me n points on x, you consider the collection of those n points. That's a subset of x, so that's a point in run of x. Suppose that you had a sheaf on run of x. These maps were continuous ma maps by definition. That was the topology of run of x was such that these maps were continuous. So you could pull back those sheaves from run of x to xn. And for every n, you would get a, a, a sheaf on x to the n. The pullback of your sheaf b. Let's analyze what the fiber of those sheaves are. Well, if you look at the fiber over the point x1 up to xn, it would be the fiber of your original sheaf b on the set x1 up to xn. But this set doesn't care about multiplicities. The point in run of x is the same. So you get immediately all of the conditions that we had for diagonals, these conditions that when you pull back along diagonals, you need it to be the same. You get it for free just by having a sheaf on run of x. Just being a sheaf on run of x gave us this condition that the five, these vector spaces, vx and vxx and vxx and x and so forth, they're all the same. So that's good. So that's even though there are no no trivial sheaves on run of x, if there were, we would get this condition for free. So if I didn't have the information that the homotopy groups of run of x were trivial, I would be in a good track to solving this problem. So we still need to understand the other condition. The other condition was trickier. The other condition was that vxy was the tensor product of vx with vy. And this condition should come from the commutative algebra structure on the sheaf V. Okay, so our factorization algebra was a commutative algebra structure on this V, which lives over the infinite dimensional run of X. Okay, so let's understand again what was the fiber of this tensor product from V chiral tensor V, v tensor product chiral with V with itself over a set U. Well, this was all the ways of writing U as a disjoint union of sets, Vs tensor Vt. And we're mapping this V chiral tensor V chiral to V. So there should be a map at the level of fibers. So there should be a map from the fiber at U of this tensor product to the fiber at U of V. So I should get a map here from this sum into this. So let's take, for example, a particular set, which is the set U with only two elements, x and y is a pair of points in x. So let's look at this sum here. There's only two ways of decomposing the set U. The set U has two, two elements, x and y. So you can only decompose that set in two different forms as a union, as a disjoint union of two sets. Either you take x and y or the set y and x. So these are the two summons that we're picking here. So we should get a map from Vx tensor Vy plus Vy tensor Vx to Vxy. Now, since we want a commutative algebra, this map should not depend on the order in which I pick x and y. Namely, if I switch the two factors from V chiral to v tensor v, from V tensor V, and then I apply the map, it should be the same as just applying it before. That means that this map it's only well is determined completely with what happens in one of the summons. So I just get I, it's enough to look at just the first summon, and I get a map from Vx tensor Vy to Vxy. And this is very much what I wanted to have on this V2 restricted away from the diagonal. I want this map, and moreover, I want this map to be an isomorphism. So we get for free this map from being a commutative algebra, and we will get that this map is an isomorphism once we include that this algebra needs to be a unital commutative algebra. So the unit would give me the fact that this map needs to be an isomorphism. OK. So that's uh, a point where, let me, let me just recap what we've done. I started with playing this game. I said, I want to construct a geometric object that whenever you give me endpoints on a curve x, I will give you back a vector space. 
this vector space, the physicists call them the space of endpoint functions. And now I want to describe how to glue those endpoint functions. If you give me twice the same point, you should get the same space. If you give me different points, you should get the tensor product of spaces. So this is the notion of locality in physics. We're trying to axiomatize this in a properly, in a properly defined algebra geometric object. We've gathered some intuition by looking at this space of subsets of points on X. This is called the run space of X. And we constructed a tensor structure on the category of sheaves on the run space of X. And we've seen that if I construct a commutative algebra object in this category of sheaves of the run space of X, I would get for free the gluing conditions for these endpoint functions, for these vector spaces. The problem is that there are no, no trivial sheaves of topological spaces on run of X. To make them non-trivial, we need to understand the algebra geometric aspects of it. So here is a good spot perhaps to make a quick stop. Because from now on, things are going to get actual technical. I'm going to start with actually describing what the algebra geometric objects are and using functors that might be non-trivial. So probably here is a good spot to make a, like a five to 10 minute stop. All right, welcome back. Uh, okay, so we've decided that this space run of X seems reasonable to define what, uh, to, to model the moduli space of configuration of points on X, which is where we want to have our conformal field theory. So, uh, now I want to understand what is, what, what does it mean to do algebraic geometry in such a space? I mean, this space, whatever this space is, it has inside a copy of the curve X, because as sets with cardinality one, it has inside a copy of the square of X, it has got inside a copy of every power of X. So if I were, were to think of it as having a, some dimension, it would be an infinite dimensional space. Uh, and I like to understand what does it mean to look at vector bundles or what are coherent sheaves or quasi coherent sheaves or sheaves of D modules in general. So what I want is to model vector bundles with flat connections on that space. Uh, so let's start with this again. For any finite set I, then we can just take maps from I into X. So that's X to the I. And we have a map from X to the I to run of X. X to the I is an algebraic variety of dimension, the cardinality of I, because X was of dimension one. And this run of X is nasty as it is. It doesn't matter where it is, but these maps are nice enough. We're defining the topology of this so that this map is continuous. For every surjection from a different, from a set J, also finite set into a set I, we get a diagonal embedding. This diagonal embedding is to make in some of the points in X to J to be equal. That's why diagonal. And it just means, well, if you have a point in X to the I, that's a map from I to X, you compose it with the surjection and you get a map from J to X. So this is, the, this is a closed embedding, which is a diagonal embedding. So we have a map from X to the J to run of X. Whenever you have J points in X, you have get a subset of X, therefore a point in run of X. We have a map from X to the I to run of X and we have the diagonal embedding, and this diagram commutes. And of course, I drew the arrow the other way around. Typically, you would write it this way. But anyways, this diagram commutes for any such uh, for any such diagonal. So we want to say that run of x is the co-limit, is the union of all the powers of x to the i over all possible finite sets. Now, this co-limit here or union doesn't make really any sense because the finite sets I are, do not form a directed set. They do not form uh, a filtered category. Sets with this morphism being surjection, this is not a directed set, so we cannot really take a co-limit. But we can try to make it properly well-defined. So this on the, on the right-hand side here, I have finite dimensional smooth varieties. So that's why it's a nice object. And what I would want to say is that I want to describe a quasi-coherent sheaves, a quasi-coherent sheaf on run of X has a limit or a co-limit of quasi-coherent sheaves on X to the I for every I. Once I do that, then I can describe this category that I'm interested in in terms purely of algebra geometric objects over finite dimensional varieties. 
And there's many options that we can take. That's where the situation becomes slightly technical. So let me tell you first, what does it mean to be a star sheaf of O modules on random X? So this is going to be a proper definition. So you will take a collection of quasi coherent sheaves on X to the I for every finite set I together with, well, the obvious homomorphisms, which is you have uh, the FJ is isomorphic, uh, I'm sorry, the pullback of FJ by the diagonal homo uh, homomorphism, you want it to be isomorphic to FR. This was the conditions that we wanted on our shift V. But we want, it, so therefore by adjunction, since this pullback has a right adjoint, which is the push forward, we want these maps from FJ to the push forward along the diagonal of FI inducing those isomorphisms. So this is exactly the same as what I was using before for the VIs. Remember, if I had a sheaf on run of X, I could pull it back, that sheaf, by any X to the I, and I would get a sheaf on every X to the I. And these were the gluing conditions along the elements. But I could do something funny. I could do something different. I could, since these maps, the diagonal maps, are closed, are proper, they're finite, they're just closed embeddings, then the push forward has a right adjoint, which is this funny looking upper shrink that I wrote here. So what I would impose is the following. A shrink sheaf is going to be a collection of sheaves where you have this map in the other direction. So instead of from FJ to the push forward of FI, we would want to have a map from the push forward of FI to FJ in such a way that by the adjunction, you get an isomorphism now between FI and the restriction of FJ to the diagonal. It's just that now the restriction is not by the usual push for pullback, is the restriction by the strict pullback. So for those of you who do know, uh, I'll be interested in looking at uh, right D modules on X to the I, and this pullback is the pullback, the upper dagger, what people typically call. If you're looking at uh, sheaves of O modules, then this is the right adjoint that appears in graph duality or in Bertier duality, uh, and is well the right adjoint to the push forward of to the proper push forward. At any rate, this is the restriction. This typically appears by restricting to sections with compact support. So that's the notion of a sheaf on run of X. And the beauty of this definition is that this definition does not use at all run of X itself. It is a definition given by a family of sheaves on X to the I for every X for every I. And these are sheaves, quasi coherent sheaves on finite dimensional varieties. So let's try to understand this slightly better. So let's try to construct such sheaf. So from now on, I would say D module. And by D module, I would mean uh, if you were a vector bundle with a flat connection, that would be a left D module. It's just that I will require, I will allow this vector bundle to have infinite rank. Uh, otherwise, if you want to think of O modules, just quasi coherent sheaves, uh, that's fine too. Uh, but I would keep in mind the D module structure in a second, where this is going to become evident that it's needed for those of you who know what a D module is. So I want to construct such a family. So how do I construct such a family without using the rank space of X? Well, what I could do is the following. For every set I, there's a unique surjection to the set with only one point. So this gives me a diagonal embedding, which is the unique diagonal embedding from X into a power of X to the I. It just sends a point X to the same point, X, 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 I times. So if you started with a sheaf on X, you can push it forward to X to the I. And you define that to be your sheaf FI. Notice that the support of the sheaf FI is in X, which is inside of X to the I. So the sheaf that you're pushing forward, it's supported in the small diagonal. So you're not getting much. But now you define this F to be that collection. It's the collection of FI, which is just the push forward of that little F1 everywhere. So if F1 was a D, so this F1 was a D module, all of these guys are D modules supported on the diagonal. If F1 was an O module, all of these guys would be O modules supported on the diagonal. 
The claim is that this FI is a G module on random X. So it does satisfy the properties of the previous slide, which, is, which are these properties. And here, to satisfy these properties, you do need the D module structure. Namely, here I'm going to be using the fact that if I push forward and then pull back, I get the same thing as pulling back and then push forward. So those are the conditions with all diagonals. And this is not true for all modules, but it is true for D modules. OK. What is the beauty of what we constructed is that I've given now a proper definition of what a category of sheaves is on the finite, given only finite dimensional data. These are a collection of sheaves on x to the i satisfying these pullback conditions with the isomorphism that are pullback conditions. And now I, I haven't mentioned random x. I've never used, I, in this definition, there's no mention of this infinite dimensional object. But this infinite dimensional object was essential to our definition of the tensor product structure on this category of sheaves. And this was essential because we used the operation on that space random x, which was taking this joint union of sets. So I would still want to define a tensor product of these sheaves. And the statement is that, yes, there is a way of defining a tensor product of these families of sheaves. To describe you what this tensor product is, is slightly complicated, but I can give you what the, uh, I, I, I can give you the, the case of the star case and the Kyra case in a second. So let's, let's try to do this. So we have F now would be a sheaf on run of X, which now by definition is a collection F I for every X to the I. So let's suppose that we have two such collections and we want to take the tensor product. So I'm going to describe the star product. Well, so now I need to give you a new collection. For every i, I need to give you the, the sheaf that it would be the component i on x to the i of the tensor product. So what do you do? Well, you write your i as a union j and k. This is a disjoint union. i as a disjoint union of j and k. You consider fj on x to the j. You consider gk on x to the k. And you take their box product. Remember, this was the pullback of xi to xj by the projection and the pullback of, from xi to xk by the other projection, and you take the tensor product in x to the i. So this is a sheaf on x to the i, and you take the sum of all those sheaves. So that's the star product. And if you look at the fiber of this thing, you would get exactly the fiber over a point x1 up to xi. You would get exactly what, uh, what we had before that you just look at all the ways of writing that particular set as this joint union of points, and you will have the fiber of one tensor, the fiber of the other. So this has the same fibers as what I had described before for shifts on random X. And the same for this. Uh, so this is the chiral product, where instead of just taking uh, for fibers, we were taking unions, we take disjoint unions. It's the same thing, it's just that now, not only you pull them back, the shifts fj and gk, but you pull them back and you allow singularities. So you restrict them to an open subset of x to the i, which considers of this open u, where you allow singularities whenever a point here in xj uh, would be equal to a point here in the set x in the set k. So that's the same thing as saying, let's look at the shift and restrict it to the open set where those points are actually different. We're going to look at an ex explicit example in the second for the square of the curve. Now, the, the point is that this tensor product never uses random X. It's a well-defined family of sheaves. It does satisfy the conditions that I described before for G modules, namely the pullbacks of these, tens of these families are compatible uh, with this condition here, uh, two slides ago, with this condition here. So you get a new uh, sheaf on random X. And the interesting thing is that with this definition of sheaves of all modules or D modules on random X, there are many non-trivial examples. Actually, any vertex algebra would give rise to such a thing.
Interestingly enough, let's describe explicitly what this sheaf is when uh, in the unique example that we started with that we constructed. So we already constructed one example of a sheaf on run of X given a sheaf on X. And this sheaf was very simple. It was supported on X. It was, you started with F1, uh, that is a sheaf on X, and we defined this family Fi, which was just the push forward along the diagonal of F1. Uh, here I should have written F1, and here I should have written G1 as well. So on X to the I, you have a sheaf that is supported on the small diagonal. And on X to the I here, you have a sheaf that is supported on the small diagonal. But the interesting thing is that when you take the tensor product of these two sheaves that are supported on the diagonal, you get something that is supported everywhere. So let's analyze this with care. So what is the sheaf on X, the component X to one, on X to the one of the tensor product of F with G? Well, we would need to be able to write a set with one element as a disjoint union of two sets that are non empty. So that's impossible. There's no way of doing this. So that sum is zero. There's zero summons. So that's why the tensor product has no component in x to the one. But it has already components in x squared. So let's see. In x squared, I would have two, a set with two elements that I need to write as a disjoint union of two different sets. Well, so I pull back under one set with one element. I pull back under one set with one element, take the tensor product and restrict to the open away from the diagonal. And the same thing when I write the union of the, the two sets with two elements as a union of two elements in the other order. So I have these two summons. So that's what the tensor product of these two things is over x squared. And I already see something. I already see that on x squared, the support is away from the diagonal. I started with two sheaves whose supported, who support was on the diagonal. So if you look at F2, F2 here is supported on the diagonal because it's, it's the push forward on the diagonal of F1. But if I take the tensor product of these two sheaves supported on the diagonal, and I get something that is the support is actually away from the diagonal. Now, of course, uh, if I take G to be equal to F, there's an action of the symmetric group of two elements that's expected, right? If I take the tensor product of F with F, it should be isomorphic to the tensor product of F with F when I, uh, when I flip the factors. And that isomorphism here is exchanging these two summons. So sim2 of F restricted to x squared is just one of the two summons. That's what I'm writing here. Here, j that I've used here is the open embedding of x squared minus the diagonal to the x squared. So we could have taken the wedge product instead of, this, instead of the symmetric product. So again, the component of wedge 1f on, on, on x1 is just f1, the sheaf I started with. And wedge 2f over x, uh, over x squared is just one of the two summons. The only difference between wedge 2f and sin 2f is the behavior under flipping the two factors of x squared. When I flip the two factors of x squared on sin 2, I flip these two factors and I take a plus one sign. That's the isomorphism. And on wedge 2, I flip these two factors and I add an extra minus sign. So that I hope it's enough to give you an intuition of what the wedge n power of f would be. And indeed, the wedge n power of f would have components in x1, in x2, in x3, and so forth, up to xn. And the component in xn would be f1 box f1 box f1 n times, and then restricted to the open set where uh, away from all possible diagonals. <clears throat> okay, so we we now have a tensor structure in the category of sheaves on run of x. We constructed this tensor product, which is not trivial to compute. I've given you just some of the components of this tensor product on lower dimensional powers of the curve x. It's not trivial to compute. It's not trivial to construct, but it's there. It's, um, it gives me a well-defined tensor structure on the category of D modules or O modules on random X. 
If you have a tensor category, you can look at what are Lie algebras. We're interested in constructing commutative algebras, but compute, actually constructing commutative algebras directly is non trivial in run of X. But constructing Lie algebras is very simple. So that's why it's better to start with Lie algebras. So the approach I want to take is I'm going to start with a Lie algebra, and out of a Lie algebra, I'm going to construct a commutative algebra. So this is an interesting, this is a, a, a very simple observation. If you have a Lie algebra, that's a map from G where G to G on any tensor category, then you can, you have the complex that computes its homology. So this is just, you take G, the sum wedge two of G, wedge three of G and so forth, take this infinite sum. If G is infinite dimensional, this never stops. This is a complex. It has a differential of degree minus one. It sends wedge K to wedge K minus one. Uh, and it has a commutative algebra structure. It is a super commutative algebra structure, which is just given by the wedge product. And it is a DG algebra. Well, D is a differential. And well, it's a DG co-algebra. So this is a bi-algebra, which is commutative and co-commutative algebra. This is a chevalier eilenberg complex that computes the homology of G. So I've written this as sim G, Sim, the symmetric product of G shifted by one. By symmetric, I really mean the wedge product here. So I put G in degree minus one, and I take the symmetric power of this, which just means just take wedge powers of G. So that's a way of constructing commutative algebras starting from a Lie algebra. And we're gonna do exactly that. So let's start with F1, a vector bundle on X with a connection. So a D module on X. We construct a family of sheaves on X to the I by just pushing forward under the diagonal embedding F1. This is supported at X. This is by definition a sheaf which is supported at X on run of X. And let's understand what does it mean to have a Lie algebra structure on that sheaf F. So this should be a map from F wedge F to F. That satisfies the Jacobi condition. The, the fact that this bracket is Q symmetric is the fact that you have a well defined map from F wedge F to F. Okay, so let's understand what, what is, I mean, this F is an infinite family of sheaves on X to the I for every I, and F wedge F is a non trivial sheaf on every X to the I for every I. So we need to understand what such a map would mean. A map between these families means for every I, you have a map from the component X to the I of this guy to the component x to the i of this other one. So what is that map? Well, if we look at f wedge f in x1, that was 0. And f in x1 is f1, the shift I started with. So I have the 0 map. There's nothing to, to do there. But we've already computed the map f wedge f in degree 2. f wedge f in degree 2 was this funny looking thing where we take f1 pull it back by one projection, F1, pull it back by the second projection, and restrict it away from the diagonal. And on the other hand, the shift F in degree two was the push forward along F1, of F1 along the diagonal. So the Lie bracket on F in particular would give me a map from F1 box F1 restricted away from the diagonal to the push forward of F1. This is the first component that is non-trivial of this Lie bracket. I need to understand what are all the other components. I need to understand what is the component on X cubed, the component on X fourth, and so forth. But the beauty of a Lie algebra is that any n-ary operation on a Lie algebra is obtained by applying several times a binary operation, a Lie bracket. So if you want an n-ary operation on Lie algebra, you can always compose, you can always obtain it by composition of several times applications of the Lie bracket. That means that all the higher maps on this Lie algebra F would be obtained completely determined by this unique map here. So even though having a Lie algebra on run of X, which is supported at the curve X, seems like a huge amount of information because I need these maps for every X to the I, all that information is completely determined by this map here, which happens on X squared. This is a map of shifts on the power on the second power of X. And here's the connection with the other part of the board on the very first slide. This is a definition of what a chiral algebra is. 
a chiral algebra easily added on the run of x, which is supported at x. In particular, it is a map from f1 box f1 restricted away from the diagonal to the push forward along the diagonal of f1. That satisfies the Jacobi condition. So that's the definition of what a chiral algebra is. It's just a Lie algebra in that sense. It's a bracket defined from, you have your chiral algebra boxes with itself restricted away from the diagonal and map it to the push forward along the diagonal. That satisfies the Jacobi condition. And here's one example. Remember that we would need uh, the rank of these things either to be one or infinity. Here's an example where the rank is one. On X, you take the sheaf of differentials on X. So this is a right D module on X. So these are just volume forms on your algebraic curve X. So now you look at X squared. So these are volume forms on X that you box with volume forms on, uh, on X. So these are the two projections. So uh, something here would look like F of X DX where x is a coordinate on the curve x. And something here would look like f of y dy, where y is another copy of the same coordinate on x. So you take this box problem. And you restrict away from the diagonal the shift. This means you allow the functions to uh, have singularities when x is equal to y. But something that looks like a function of x, y, dx, box dy, that looks like omega of x squared. These are volume forms on x squared. Why volume forms here? Well, this was very important. When I took, I took f wedge f. That means that this shift here was one of the two summons of my shift. But the isomorphism when I flipped the two factors x with x would send the, the section dx which box dy to the section minus dy box dx. If I had taken the symmetric product, I would have gotten a plus dy, and then I wouldn't have gotten this isomorphism because this shift here has the same property under the exchange of the two factors of x. So that's why the first isomorphism. So we want a chiral algebra structure on the shift of volume forms, and this is just the standard residue map. You have a function f of x, y, dx, wedge, dy. You can obtain a map to this push forward by just taking the residue at x is equal to y you obtain a one day differential. And this satisfies the usual Jacobi condition. A chiral algebra is a Lie algebra, it's a non-unital chiral algebra, just a Lie algebra uh, map that comes equipped with a map from omega one, from omega of x, which is compatible with the uh, with this uh, Lie bracket. So that's a definition of what a chiral algebra is. So since you have a Lie algebra, you can always take this commutative algebra that is the sum of all the positive wedge powers of that commutative algebra. So that's the chevalet eilenberg complex that, commutes, that computes uh, the Lie algebra homology of this Lie algebra. And the claim is that this is a commutative algebra, so therefore that by definition that is a factorization algebra. The problem is that this is really not a sheaf, this is a complex of sheaves. So we need to understand this. We wanted to get a, an actual sheaf, not a complex of sheaves. I don't want to be working on a derived category because the space is infinite dimensional. The derived category itself is complicated. Oops. So the theorem of Bellinson and Dreamfeld is quite interesting is that the, this map from Lie algebras to commutative algebras is a bijection, namely, any factorization algebra on the run space of X arises of this form as the chevalet eilenberg complex of a chiral algebra. So it's an equivalence of categories between chiral algebras and factorization algebras. And moreover, this complex, even though it is a complex, it can be viewed as just a sheet because it has homology in only one degree, which is the degree minus n. So this complex, is a complex of sheaves on run of x. It is an infinite sum of the wedge, the kth power of wedge power of f, 
And again, it is a complex of shifts on run of X. That means that for every I, it's a complex of shifts on X to the I. And if you take this complex of shifts on X to the N and you look at the homology of that complex, that complex has only homology in the degree minus N, the dimension of the power X to the N. So this is hard to, this is as technical as it will get. So let's understand, let's try to understand this in the lower dimensional examples, because what, this is where everything happens. So let's try to understand what is this complex over x1. Well, we've already seen that wedge 2 of f on x1 was 0. So the only, comp so wedge 3 of f on x1 is 0, wedge n of x of f on x1 would be 0. The only component of this complex in x1 is just the shift that I started with, which is f1. It's just that I'm putting it in degree minus one. In the chevalier Eilemer complex, you put the Lie algebra in degree minus one. So the homology of that complex on X1 is the shift that you started with F1 in degree minus one. Let me rename this shift F1. Let me call it A1. Since F1 was a left, a, a right D module, I'm going to make it into a left D module by tensoring with the tangent bundle of X. So I'm going to use A1 sub supra L to denote just this F1 tensor with the tangent bundle of X. That's all we have on the power of the curve X. Let's look at what the complex is on X2. So on X2, well, we have two components now. So we already know, you, you can guess that wedge 3 of F on X2 would be zero, in as much as wedge 2 of F on X1 was zero. Why would X wedge 3 of F on X2 would be zero? Well, because wedge 3 of F on X2 would try to decompose a set with two elements into a disjoint union of three sets. And this is impossible, as these three sets should be non-empty. So you can only decompose a set with two elements as a disjoint union of two sets or of one set. So these are the two different summons. You're going to get the component in X2 of wedge 1 of F on the component of wedge 2 uh, of, of, of X2 of wedge 2 of F. And these are all the other components of this complex are zero. So now, what is the component on X2 of wedge 2 of F? Well, this was this, F1 box F1 restricted away from the diagonal. And what is the component of x2 of wedge 1 of f, well, this was by definition the push forward on the diagonal. And in our complex, the differential is the Lie algebra bracket. So this is the differential of the complex. So the, our complex, which is our factorization algebra, in degree 2 looks like a complex that has two terms. And what is the homology of this complex? Well, the fact that we have a unital chiral algebra means that uh, this map is sur surjective. You would take the unit in one of these factors and that would act like a unit. So you would get a, a pre-image for any section here by putting the same section here on one of the factors and the units on the other factor. So this map is surjective. So there's no homology in degree minus one, but there is a homology in degree minus two is the kernel of the differential. So. This is the theorem of Bellingson and Drenthal in degree two, that the homology of this complex is concentrated as the kernel of the differential in degree minus d. Now, in general, you, the, their theorem is that you write this complex in degree n, you're going to find a complex that starts from degree minus n up to degree minus one. It looks very similar to this. And the only, this complex is a cyclic except in the first degree, which is minus n, and the kernel of that differential of that map is the only homology of that complex. So here I'm calling this A2, and I'm going to make A2 left to be A2 tensor with uh, the inverse of volume forms on x squared. In as much as here I took the tangent bundle of x, which is the inverse of volume forms on x. And this way you obtain a sequence of vector model of D modules, left D modules, on X, on X squared, on X cubed, and so forth. Let's analyze that sequence. Now these are honest 
D modules. These are not complexes of D modules. So let's analyze how A2 appeared. A2 appeared as the kernel of the differential. I am writing here in this sequence. This is a short exact sequence. This was surjective because, uh, because our algebra was unital. And A2 was defined to be the kernel. So let's pull back the sequence along the open embedding, which is away from the diagonal. A1 was the push forward along the diagonal. So if we pull back away from the diagonal, we get zero. So when I pull back this thing away from the diagonal, this thing here is zero. That means that these two become isomorphic. So the pullback away from the diagonal of A2 is the pullback away from the diagonal of A1 box A1, which is exactly the factorization property that we wanted in our sequence of sheets. So this means that A2 away from the diagonal is A1 box A1 away from the diagonal. There was the property that we wanted on a factorization algorithm. How about pushing the sequence back by the diagonal? Well, when I push back the sequence by the diagonal, well, then this guy was by definition a restriction away from the diagonal, so the middle guy becomes zero. So the middle guy becomes zero, and this means that you get an isomorphism between this and this A1, but shifted by one. The pullback along the diagonal of, a, of the push forward along the diagonal is just A1. But you get this shifted by one. And this is the reason why our factorization algebra is not A1, A2, and so forth. We needed to tensor with volume, uh, inverse of volume forms, inverse of volume forms, and so forth to shift from right D modules to left D modules. That, that tensoring removes this shifting. And this is why we get the compatibility with, uh, with pullbacks by diagonals. All right, so what did I talk about so far? What I said is, and I, and I gave a couple of examples. We, we start with a Lie algebra. This, the, what was the data of this Lie algebra was a vector bundle with a connection on an algebraic curve X and a map between this and this map, the, the last map in this sequence here, A1, is what wants to be our Lie algebra. This is in, happening in X squared. So this map is the data of the Lie algebra. Out of this data, we constructed the chevalet eilenberg complex of that in the RAND space of X, and that gave us an infinite family of D modules on X to the N for every N that satisfies the factorization property. There was the funny-looking geometric object that solves the original problem that we wanted to start with, which is taking the fibers of x1 up to xn to be a vector space of endpoints. Uh, now the question, and, and I made a claim, which is out of any commutative algebra comes, any commutative algebra, any factorization algebra comes in this way. That claim is very hard to prove. That, that, that statement is not something that I'm going to be talking about. That's, a, that's the main theorem of Bellinger and Drinfeld. But now what I want to talk about is how to construct these Lie algebras, and therefore, by this construction of the chevalier eilenberg complex, get a factorization algebra. And this is the connection with vertex algebras. So let's focus now on the case where our curve is just the line, is the affine line. And let's consider one of these Lie algebras, these chiral algebras, but not to be an arbitrary D module. What is a D module on A1? It's just a vector space which has an action of the Weyl algebra. So I know how to multiply by X, and I know how to differentiate by x. Uh, so instead of taking an arbitrary D module, I'm going to take a translation invariant D module. So this means that I'm going to be taking a vector space. Uh, here I use a field K, but it could be just the complex, the complex numbers. And it comes with an endomorphism. So I'm going to call that endomorphism T. And then the sheaf that I'm going to be taking is going to be the sheaf associated to take polynomials in x. So the global sections of this sheet is going to be polynomials in X with coefficients in the vector space V. And the act, so the action of multiplication by X is very simple. Just multiply the polynomial by X. And the action of D by DX uses this endomorphism T in my vector space. So if you give me a section, it's a vector A in V, a function, a polynomial in X, 
and d by dx acts by t on a and d by dx on the polynomial x. So those are d modules on the affine line that are translation invariant. Oops. Now, the differential on my Lie algebra, remember, remember what was our, our Lie algebra structure, would be a map between this pool, between this box product and the push forward along the diagonal of F1. So I need to describe these two things. But since my D module is translation invariant, I'm still going to be looking at translation invariant sections. So this thing here looks like a tensor product of two copies of V, and then I should allow arbitrary functions on X and Y. Remember also that this, I should be looking at uh, DX box DY, but I don't care about this because the tangent bundle on the line is trivial. So to look at translation invariant sections, I would not allow arbitrary functions of X and Y. I would allow only functions of X minus Y. Again, the reason why I'm allowing X functions, functions of X minus Y and not X plus Y is because this was the component of F wedge F and not F sim 2 F. So this is what the Lie algebra version, I'm sorry, the linear algebra version is by taking global sections of this component uh, of F wedge F. And the push forward along the diagonal of the D module F1 is this, is V tensor K of that. Okay, so what is the Lie algebra structure? It's just a map. Here I've used the coordinate T to be, uh, T to be the, the, the coordinate X minus Y. So you take a function of x minus y and x minus y inverse, a vector a in v, a vector b in v, and you map it to v polynomials. Well, I, you, I had this, this lab del before that meant a differential operator along x squared that wasn't part of x. I just renamed it to v lambda. That's just because it's more common in the language of vertex algebras. And this is, this is something that Vecla, Jethro already spoke about in this class. So we're looking for a map like this. And it should be a map of d modules. OK, so how does T act on this side? Well, if you act on T on A and you differentiate for F on the function F, it should be the same as acting with del on this uh, on V of lambda. A multiplication by del, remember that it was the same thing as lambda. I was calling lambda at this time. So this is the condition of one of the conditions of being a D module. There's another condition when you act with T on B on the second component here. And then here, it should be minus F prime because, well, remember, T was X minus Y and not X plus Y. But it's very similar to this first condition here. And then there's another condition, which is how multiplication by X minus Y works. And this is D by D lambda. Uh, that's also very simple to check uh, that this, this corresponds to being a map of D modules. So an interesting fact about this D module is that uh, the, the D module on this side is completely determined by the fun by, uh, as a D module. It's generated by one guy, which is the guy 1 over T. It's not generated by the function 1 because you cannot differentiate. If you differentiate 1, you get, uh, you get 0. So you can never get to 1 over T if you started with the function 1 by applying differential operators on the line. But you can get to any other uh, element of k t, t, t inverse by differentiating or multiplication or multiplying by t's by powers of t starting with one over t. So this map, because it is a map of v modules, is completely determined by what is the image of v tensor v. So we look at a tensor v times one over t. We map it and we obtain a polynomial in lambda. This polynomial in lambda, we put names. The constant coefficient, we call it a times v. And all of the other coefficients define, all of the coefficients that are uh, powers of lambda, we define these products a, j, v. So that's a definition of the operations here by starting from a Lie algebra in the sense of chiral algebras. And the theorem is that the operations of this normally ordered oper uh, product operation and this lambda bracket defined this way, endow the vector space V with a structure of a vertex algebra. So this is 
uh, the connection between chiral algebras and vertex algebras. The statement, the proper statement I just made is, if you look at a chiral algebra on the, on the line that is translation invariant, then by looking at global sections, that thing is a vertex algebra with this operation defined this way. The converse is true. If you start with a vertex algebra and you V with the operation of normally ordered products and all of the lambda brackets, the higher uh, products of the OPEs, and uh, you look at the space V polynomials in X with coefficients in V, that thing is a D module on the line that has an obvious scalar algebra structure. All right, so that's the connection of uh, vertex algebras with chiral algebras, which by the construction of the chevalet Eilenberg complex gives you a factorization algebra, which is the geometric object. All right, so that's everything I wanted to talk today, uh, which is manifestly high level. However, further topics that you may want to cover are vertex algebras that are known to be constructed. Now we have this equivalence of categories between vertex algebras and factorization algebras. But factorization algebras are prone to be constructed geometrically because they are these objects that factorize over a curve. And there are indeed geometric objects that produce factorization algebras that we do not know how to construct in a linear algebra setting. Examples of that are things that are, uh, that are important in the theory of like the geometric Langlands program uh, for example, the chiral Hecke algebra is an example of a vertex algebra that we know it exists, and we only know how to construct in some very special cases. Uh, those vertex algebras were constructed purely geometrically. There's the notion of chiral homology, uh, which is just simply taking global sections on the run space of these sheaves that we constructed. There's the notion of a smooth notion of, of uh, factorization algebras. For physicists, this is much more like the usual notion of factorization of endpoints of, of endpoint functions or, or, or local observables. Uh, but the connection between this smooth notion of factorization algebras and the algebra geometric notion that I just described today is much more subtle. Uh, it, it was unknown and it was in the folklore for many years. A couple of weeks ago, a paper appeared in the archive claiming to have a functor between connecting these two different worlds. Uh, I'm not sure about the correctness of that paper yet, uh, but at least there is a formal claim out there that these two things are the same, which would be great because vertex algebras we know and love for many years now on representation theory. So we know how to construct a lot of these algebra geometric objects. Um, we know how to prove a lot of things about these smooth objects. Oh, I see a hand up. 